everyone, and uh, welcome to lecture number three of Programming for EOR. This lecture today is going to be a rather short version because this, unlike the others, is not a live stream directly, it's a direct recording for this lecture here because uh, I'm still not feeling 100%, but I want to give you this lecture nevertheless because I think you deserve this since you're already doing the assignment for this week here. So I um, hope you appreciate it. And if there's any questions, of course, uh, feel free to use our Discord server or simply put the comments, uh, well, ask in the comments section below the video. And uh, for what we're going to be doing today, the main topic is recursion. Recursion is, um, well, to say it like this, when you have a function that uh, takes input a simpler version of itself. So basically it keeps calling itself until it reaches some initial stage. What do I mean by that, you may think? Well, hopefully, as we go along, it's going to become a little more clear here. So besides recursion, we of course are going to read and write data again, just a little briefly, because I want to keep it building step by step as uh, we approach more data handling, which will come next week. Then, of course, we're also going to be uh, working a little with packages and libraries again, just as we as we go. And then we follow up. The last things are going to be a couple of Monte Carlo simulations. Well, we're going to look at Buffon's needle problem, also one of the problems you're going to see back in the assignment for this week, a little different version, of course. And then we're going to look at the infamous boy-girl paradox. I call it here the daughter problem. I don't know why it's called that. I never changed the name, but um, now having a daughter myself, the daughter problem seems actually quite appropriate. Ha 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 ha. No. First, let's set the directory as usual and just get started, right? So I'm also back in a white version here because people had, first we did the white version, if people wanted dark, then we tried dark, then the majority actually wanted the light version. So we're back at light version. I hope you agree now. Let's just stick with this. Otherwise, let me know if there's a better color scheme you want. Um, so first, let's just look at a non-recursive version of a piece of code, a more of an iterative code. So you can do it iterative or you can do recursive sometimes. R is one of the languages where you can actually use recursion. Not all languages accommodate that, but R definitely does. So, for instance, if you want to calculate factorials, so I'm doing a function here just like we learned last week. We have the name of the function, of course. We have its input, so i.e. its formals. We have everything, the body of the function. And then, of course, the environment that we talk about here that we don't really see, but we talk about just the global environment because we're not working with any sub-environments, at least not for this course here. So... This here, as you can see, there's two special cases here that if the input is zero or one, you return just one. Why the factorial of zero is one? You can always YouTube that, but it's, all, it's a very interesting, uh, very interesting theory also. And then of course, if you have for any higher number than one, then of course we use the common fact here, how the factorial is calculated. So you remember how factorials are usually done in mathematics is typically used with an exclamation point. So let's first just run this piece of code here. And then, of course, <clears throat> we can simply just try it out. So if I'm just going to copy this piece here and go over here and simply just let's try and calculate the factorial of 10. Not 1, but 10. And see, as you already knew with factorials, the numbers get very large very quickly. So let's just keep this very large number in mind, which is 3,628,800. See if we get that back when we're now going to write the same way or the same function essentially, but in a recursive structure. So you could think about this as like many ways lead to Rome. Sure it does. And uh, there are reasons where some things are better and sometimes not. And I do some, I put some comments here where we're gonna refer to it later as well, because we're gonna talk about procedural units in week seven and this recursion structure here also pretty much refers to that. There's also a memory concern here. And like I said, it's not possible in all languages. So I put the notes here, but everything is written in the uh, advanced R book. I apologize for keeping rather short today because I need to how much energy I have left for this here. So when we construct a recursive function, it takes initially two, well, it has kind of like two stages within itself, right? It has an initial stage and a recursive stage. So essentially you have an initial stage, which if you're not an initial stage, the recursive stage is trying to work itself back to that stage at some point, and then the function will actually will uh, will yeah stop at that point. So, for instance, here you have a case here where the initial stage if n is equal to zero, you return a one. Here we are of course using the we are recognizing that n factorial, so factorial n is the same as n times n minus one factorial. 
because you can see here in the structure you're calling yourself again with one less number that means n minus one so you can imagine that you're actually calling the function again and then nested inside the function you're calling yourself again with one lower number all the way back until you reach the initial stage which here would then return a one so you see when I write up a fact, uh, this one in a, in a recursive version, you see the, f the function actually becomes a lot shorter. It's a more efficient in terms of writing. And so if I write it up here, and now of course we run factorial 10 again, just to see if we get the same number. And remembering from last time, we can also just roll up a little. It is indeed the same number, just to confirm that it does the same thing. And so that's definitely one way you can do this, but you may also just ask yourself, so why is recursive functions so nice and what are they actually useful for and where can you actually use it? So I've added a few examples here on where you can use them and well, why they could be useful, right? So the first one I wanna use is a palindrome. You may ask yourself, what the hell is a palindrome? So if we talk about a little linguistics for a bit, then of course, if you have a word that is the same, spell both backwards and forwards. So in a regular way, and if you also flip it around, Going to show you some examples of what I mean by that, but that's essentially a palindrome. So something that's that's the same no matter whether you read it from left to right or right to left. So that's essentially it. So if I have a palindrome function, I'm just going to call it palindrome because well, easy naming, right? And it's a function which takes the input str. I call it str simply just to stand for string, but again you could just call it x, y, c, whatnot. But str because you're taking a string here you're specifying this, you're using a word usually. So you could of course just call it XYC, like I said, but STR makes it a little more clear what type of input you're expecting. So we have some initial stages here. You can actually see there's three because there's three special conditions from when this is just, you know, directly over or you're done. First off, if, so you have three if conditions here. Let's start with the first if condition. You first take the substring, so this function substring of your input so from position one, from the start, and the end position one, if that is not the same as indeed here, the substring of, well, the number of characters, so you count the number of characters here, if that doesn't match, then of course you print false and says, this is not a palindrome, simply because, well, hey, the, um, the word doesn't match up to start with that this is not even a palindrome, that is, in this case here, the number of characters doesn't match. Well. It may seem a little weird the way I'm saying it here, but it hopefully becomes clear as I, as I explain it further on now here. So let's take number two, and then normally I would say if you still have problems with raise in the chat, but this time raise it on the server or put it in the comment section below, please. So if you look at condition two here, if the length of the word, so the number of characters is equal to two, so you have a word that is two letters long, and the substring from starting position one, so say the first from the right, first from the left when you read a word, sorry, is the same as the first from the right, is the same as, again, the second from the right and second from the left, which also means that the first and the, and the, first and the last letter in the word are the same, then sure, it's a palindrome. Example, if you just write O, O, so O, without the H at the end, of course, then of course it's a palindrome. But if I just write hi, then here you don't have that the first letter and the last letter are the same, nor from the second from the last to the second to the first. It's very strange to see, but just imagine, just write it up and you will see it. And more importantly, if the word only contains one letter, it's by definition a palindrome. So just the word I, right? Or just any, just one letter. That will also be a palindrome. So here you have three base conditions from which it is false, true, true. Okay, so hopefully that should be clear right now. And to explain a little further on the first one here, this was just to clarify again. So now let's go back to that, like I said I would. This basically just says, if the first letter at the end and the start are not the same, that's essentially what you're saying. If they're not the same, well, then it's not a palindrome, then don't even bother, okay? So if you have a longer word and you don't need to check everything, because if you already know that the first letter in the word is not the same as the last letter, then you already know this is not a palindrome. So please stop, okay. Then you come to the recursive stage, and this is where it becomes really interesting. So you say here, if the substring from position one to position one, so that is the first letter and the last letter, is the same again, that it fits, that it fits here again, the number of, so the first and last letters fit, so yes, it's a pandemic for now, right? 
is the same as well. The same condition here that the first and last letter are the same. And the number of characters is larger than two, right? So it doesn't fall under all, one of our initial conditions. Then if that is the case, then we call the palindrome function again with the substring now, but now with position number two, where we cut off one character. How should I understand this? You should understand like this. If you first initially check here that the first and the last letter in the word are the same, so you have a longer word and you check, is letter one the same as letter the last one? Are they the same? Okay, great. Then what we do, we essentially just remove those two letters and check for the what is left. And that's what you're doing here. So you are checking now for position number two in the substring. And then of course you're shortening the number of characters by one because now the word from each end has been cut by one letter. And then you keep checking smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until you either go from two to zero or from three to one. In either case, you're going to land back in one of these initial conditions, either initial condition number two or three or one if it turns out that it's at some point it's not a palindrome. So you're going to land in one of these initial conditions up here and then it's going to stop. So I'm going to initialize this larger function here, of course, put it up here. I'm done. And now I have a lot of examples here of different palindromes. So let's run the first two ones. Or let's the first one here. Is it a palindrome? True. And you can always just check yourself. First letter P, last letter P. Okay, good. Let's check it. Second letter A, second to last letter A. Okay, and so forth. Check it all the way till you reach the RR in the middle and you're like, that's a palindrome. Also the name Hannah is a palindrome. You can also just check here. This is absolutely not a palindrome and then it should return indeed false. And then of course we can keep going and you have like this very long word here. I don't even know. It's probably a long Dutch word. Can't even pronounce it, not even going to try. And the same here. And here we have a giraffic, which is just a giraffe, giraffe, of course. We all know that from our Pokemon, right? And of course, if anybody played Exploding Kittens, then this is a taco cat that's also a palindrome, as you can see here. So that's simply how you would actually construct a series, which is just palindromes. Super cool, right? Now, one more thing we can do with recursive sequencing is the Fibonacci sequence. And I'm also going to show it here. And um, I'm going to do it in two stages here. First, we're going to show a simplistic just recursive code, just like we've done here. I'm not going to do it in, in uh, an iterative code on this one, just an initial recursive structure. And then we're going to build it a little bit with user input, like you maybe seen a little bit from last week. And let's just initialize the function directly here, because what we do see here directly is that you have an initial condition here that if, if it's n, n is equal to one or less than one, then you just return n, fine. Then if not, then you enter the recursive stage where you are returning here the function again of n minus one. So you take your input minus one, suppose your input was three, then you return your input of two plus the input of one. So it gets the Fibonacci sequence, of course, the position of Fibonacci sequence is the sum of the previous two positions, right? You can always check it up here. I put all the links up here, even to good old Wikipedia. So you can see, well, if you're not sure what a Fibonacci sequence is, you can always just go and check it out. So for instance here, I can copy this one here and just try it out. We can see what is the fifth position in the Fibonacci sequence. And interesting enough, it's Five. We can also just try a little more here. What is the fourth position in the Fibonacci sequence? That is three. Well, because one plus two is three. Wow, I'm doing quick maths here for you even today. Uh, <coughs> and I see I'm not 100% guys, but I'm doing the best I can. So we can, of course, extend this a bit with taking input from the user, because this is just a first step to kind of make some kind of interaction with the computer on you as the user. So of course you can do this and read in as an integer. So you make a read, you make it to prompt here saying enter a number. And then we can for instance enter the number 10 because now we want the 10th position. So you see here, it saves our value down here an integer 10 L to denote, denote this as an integer. We also use the as integer to make sure that the input is translated into an integer or coerced. And then of course we run in here our code or we update our function from earlier. As you can see here, you say here, if the terms here are zero, then well, we have to please enter a positive number. So we're putting in a condition, hey, you cannot just enter anything. 
And then otherwise you have to print Fibonacci sequence four and then up until these terms, then you can simply just print all the numbers in the sequence. So whereas the previous function just gives you, well, the sum of this position in the sequence, this one will show you the sequence until that number, which I think is quite cool. So now I put in 10, I run the code and you see this is the sequence up until position number 10. So 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21 and 34 where if you just put it in the other function and put in number 10, it will give us 34 as return. So as you can see here, recursive can actually do a lot of cool stuff for you. And one thing it definitely can do, it can save a lot of space in terms of writing it. <sighs> so remember again, and I put the note here again, because people tend to forget, a recursive function always contains initial stage and a recursive stage. Now, Let's read some data for you, shall we? And this is what we're going to keep rather brief because this is just just so you get primed a little on it because, uh, yes, it's in the this week's assignment as well, but it's not too bad, guys. But it's also just to build up for what we're going to be doing later. So, of course, you can use this read line prompt again so you can simply make your console or just ask you, enter a name. Oh, I want to write Stefan. Great. And then I can also my age. Oh, this is the truth. Is it my uh, physical age or my mental age we need here? Let's just stay true to everything. Yes, guys, I am 31. I'm getting old for this. So whoosh. then, of course, we can convert the age into an integer here. There you go. Then you can also set that as numeric and character and so forth. This is just to show you can do it. You could also just combine it earlier. And of course, we can say put it all together here and simply make it hi Stefan next year you will be 32 years old wow thanks for reminding me guys this is fantastic so this is just an example right of course we can also read in files there's a simple read table function but this read table function is rather simplistic you typically use other packages for more sophisticated well operations but this one here I have a my input text file that's for instance hidden in my uh, folder that I'm using remember the directory I said in the beginning and then I can simply just see, well, what did I just print in in this file here? It's just a txt file where I put in one column of data with column named x, and it goes 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 6, 7, and so forth. And of course, we can also use these functions here to check, well, how many columns does it have? I hope only one, sure. How many rows does it have? Well, it has 16. And what's the dimensions of this? It's 16, 1. So you can actually get both in one if you just ask for the dimensions straight away. These kind of things are interesting to know. I'm going to carry on rather quickly here. So if we go to line 164, you see it's not a matrix, but rather it is actually a data frame. See, I'm not going to deal much in this week what the difference between two is, but what you should know is that, well, a matrix is more space efficient than a data frame. And a data a matrix can only take one type of data in itself, where a data frame can have each column can be a different type of data. So one can be characters, the next one can be numeric and so forth, where matrix, it all has to be the same. And if you did put multiple things in, R would automatically coerce it back to the most basic structure as we saw in week number one. Okay, let's go a little on libraries. You can of course, wait, before I forget that, you can of course also swap between different matrices. So you can set it as a matrix, but you can also set it back as a data frame. This, of course, is only very interesting because, well, it contains one column of data, so it's easy to do now, and it's just numbers, right? So it's still the same data type. So it doesn't hurt much here. If you want to save more space, you can just put it as a matrix. Now, a little more thing about data. And here we can use the library we have here because R is really cool because R has a lot of nice uh, data sets already stored within itself simply to check out. So it's quite cool. And um, we can simply just look at here by calling library data sets. So we are saying, okay, now we're going to look at all the data sets we have. We can also, of course, now let's look what we actually have in R so you can get a good overview. And here you may see some of the things we used before. I can just scroll down a little bit. And if anybody remember this Iris data set that we used here the other week here, it's here found here, for instance. And of course, we also have um, the cars data set that we used also earlier. You see back all the things that R actually has here. It's super nice. So today we're going to be just quickly looking at this air passengers. So let's just close this one down. And now we're going to put in the air data air passengers here. And now comes a new thing we need to know here about attach and detach. So 
Why do we use attach? Look here. So if I use attach first, then you noticed here before the value here said promise. Now it comes in and tells you there's a time series, right? What happens here is now I can call all the variables inside this data set just using their names. I don't have to write first air passengers dollar sign followed by the name. I don't have to write out the whole time. I'm simply attaching it directly to the main search path in R. Likewise, I can, of course, just use detach to take it away again. This is very nice, but you have to also be careful if you attach many things because, well, if the names overlap each other, it gets a big mess. But just saying this is very nice if it contains a lot of different variables, like, well, some of the example data sets that we have here. Here you can see just a quick overlook of the data set. So you got these number of airline passengers from 1949 up to 1960 in each of the months. Wow, it almost looks like uh, this year's air passengers or 2020 passengers. That's how low it is, right? So there's a different type of packages, uh, packages here you can use. And uh, while I put some example packages you use to read in different types of tables, this is not the only way to do it. There are other packages out there, of course. I'm just showing you the ones I would use, but it doesn't mean that it's the only way to do it. So feel free to explore other packages to simply just get to learn all these different things. A lot of this course here, a lot of programming is just learning by doing. It's the same way I learned it also back in the day. Now, before we go to the Monte Carlo examples, let's just spend two lines on the right table function. This is just to show it, so it's been there, so you can't see a disk, can't say I didn't show you. So we can simply write this x function here, so this x variable that I had here, this data here, I can write it to a file that I call my output file. Remember the quotation marks. And of course, I can also just paste this hello to my output file. So if I would open this file, it will simply just open and say, I have a column x that says hello, and that's it. Simple as that. Now, let's clear out everything here. And now let's go down to our Monte Carlo examples here. There's nothing new about it, but like I said also earlier, it doesn't hurt to see more examples. We're going to be going through overall two examples. But first, before we go into these real simulations at the end, let's look at some uh, straightforward standard normal distribution, or sorry, just a normal distribution. So, of course, we can simply just write a nice little nice little three line code here <clears throat> that can help you calculate the values between three and six under the curve. So the area under the normal curve between the values three and six. We want to simulate this 100,000 times. So that's the number of runs. We put it down here. Okay, so far so good. Then of course we have our simulations here where we're going to simulate. So drawing random numbers from the normal distribution with the number of runs. So that's 100,000. The normal distribution would have mean one and standard deviation 10. That's what uh, we set up here in our lines up here. As you can see now when I do this here. And of course, that's the number of simulations. Okay, great. So it's a large numeric, of course. And then, of course, we can calculate this integral under the curve simply as the sum of all the simulations that is above three and at the same time equal to or below six and divided by the number of runs because then you get the share of it, right? So let's look at it here. And then we can see here it becomes 0 0.11405. Nice, simple way to simulate, well, how many, uh, what is the area under the normal distribution between three and six? And this is kind of probability, right? So, so far, so good. I said I will keep it short and, uh, well, I apologize for that. But again, if any questions remain or anything, you can watch this back as many times as you want, of course. But also, you can always feel free to ask on the server, send me a mail, or put it in the comment section below this video. Okay, let's go to the Buffon's needle problem. And, uh, well, first I'm going to show you the dart version. So imagine you're playing darts, or you're watching R RTL7, and you're watching World Cup of Darts or something, and uh, minus the person screaming 180 in the side, which is, well, the real reason you're watching it, of course. But you can imagine that you have two dart players here. Just say it's Van Gerwe versus Gavin Price, because that's always a good game to watch, because they so much love each other, those guys. Then let's just simulate that they're throwing at the start board, right? And, well, in this simulation, they're not very good, but um, let's just play with it for a while. We're going to do this one million times. So that's the number of simulations we're going to be running, because, well, the more the merrier. That's how it goes to simulations, usually. Then, of course, we draw. <coughs> 
a random number x from the uniform, we draw it one million times, anywhere between minus one and one, because that would be the unit circle, right? Imagine you have a two-dimensional grid, or go in the middle, and then it has radius one each side, and you draw a circle here. So you draw an x-coordinate and a y-coordinate, which, of course, here will generate a box. And then, of course, if it's in the circle, it has to have this has to be less than or equal to one, because otherwise you would draw in a box. So you could draw outside when you draw these two coordinates, because you can draw all the way on either of the corners. They'll be outside this unit circle. So basically, we're just checking. Are they hitting the dartboard at all? So we're drawing a random x coordinate, check. We're drawing a random y coordinate, check. And we're checking, well, is this in the circle using the equation for a circle, which is x squared plus y squared is less than or equal to one because, well, one is the radius of this circle, right? So, so far, so good. Then let's look up this circle thing here we had here. Aha, and then you can see here we get a long, long list here that will see true, 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 false, true, and so forth, whether or not these coordinate pairs were inside the circle or not. So you can see how good they were. This more looks like me playing because I would guarantee if these world top class players are playing, they're hitting that board like 99.999% of the time where my hit rate will be significantly lower. I even think that is way too high for me to be honest, but just to give you an example. <clears throat> Let's look at it here. Now, we can do this a million times to check it, right? So let's just make an in-circle matrix, which of course is zeros. We have we make it empty first, just a bunch of zeros. We make it with uh, one column and one million rows. So it's a very, very big uh, matrix. We then just simulate, or we just run a nice little for loop. It's not necessary, but we do it anyway. And then we can simply just say, okay, we draw these numbers here and we check whether this is in the circle. So, whoop, and then we can simply go back and check the in circle now to see, well, how many of those were in. One indicates, well, it's in, zero, not. And then you can see here for each of these here, we have a lot of ins, but then also zero, zero, zero. Well, they do exist, you see? So this is definitely not world-class players, but they're definitely better than me because I will have a majority of zeros in this case here. So. But that's just the setup for this whole Buffon's needle problem, because now comes to why it can be so cool. Because remember, I drew this coordinate pair that can be a square, but can also be a circle, of course. And of course, what is so interesting here, because look here, the surface of the unit square, so the square that has like one, 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 is four, right? Because you have each of the different quadrants, all these adds up to four. One plus one plus one plus one is four, quick maths. And then the surface of the unit circle is pi. So to estimate pi, you just have to solve pi divided by four is equal to the fraction of these, well, so-called darts that you throw inside the circle. And that means with this simulation here, we can actually approximate the number pi, which is super cool, right? So by doing this, let's just say we create what we call a frac. So just a fraction that is the average number of, well, darts in the circle because between a zero one, right? So we can see here, if I generate frac here, we see that around 78.48% of these darts land inside the circle. That's a pretty good hit rate for me. For a pro player, this would be absolutely terrible, of course. And of course, we can just approximate pi, which would be four times this fraction, following the basic math we showed here on line 242. And then we can see here, what is the simulation of pi? We have it already written down here, but it makes it a little more easy to see if I use the cbind function and put my simulation next to the actual pi number. So you can see here first comes the actual pi, 3, 14, 15, whatever. I'm not very good, I'm not Rain Man, but 3, 14, that's how much I do know. And then here's a simulation which rounded, of course, is 3, 14. It's actually pretty close, you can see. The simulation here becomes rather close. We could, of course, we did it for a million, but assume now we did it even larger like 10 million, then I would probably guess that this should come even closer, right? You can always try it for yourself. Just try to increase the numbers to 10 million, run it, and see if this approximation of pi becomes even closer. So that for now should end for the Buffon needle problem, which leaves me just one thing to discuss for today before I end. And that is what I call here a daughter problem, but if you want to look it up on Google or what, it's just called the boy-girl paradox. 
I find this inherently interesting because it's also a really, really interesting paradox in probability theory. So assume now that, well, what is the probability of having two daughters? So you go up to a door, to some household, you know they have two kids. So what is the probability of them, of those two kids being two daughters? If question A, at least one of them is, uh, at least one is a girl. And question two, the probability of having two daughters, given that when you arrive and knock the door, that the, one of the daughters will open the door. What is the probability that both of the kids are, well, girls in this case? That's interesting because as you would may think here, huh, but that's just the same. That would just give 50-50, something like that. But as you would read here in the paradox here, that's actually not quite true. I'm not going to go into the greater details here. I would normally do that in a normal grand lecture here, and we can go and have a lot of fun debate about this here. But here, I'm just going to show the simulation how to actually work this through and see why this is not the case. So we're going to simulate this 100,000 times. Let me clean out this first. Simulate this 100,000 times. Then we're going to sample a lot of different families. We're going to sample families between four types of families. You either get boy, boy, girl, girl, boy, girl, or girl, boy. Equal probability. We do it, well, 100,000 times. And of course, it's with replacement. Otherwise, well, we've done after four times, right? Sample all these families. And then we generate this door matrix. Basically, like, what is the combination of kits that we see behind this door? So we fill it with zeros first. We make it 100,000 long and just one column. Now we're going to fill it out using, well, simulation. So we have three main cases here. First, we run a for loop that goes from one up until the 100,000. Then we say, if the family that we sample is a boy boy, then we know that the one that's going to answer the door is a boy. That's pretty certain. We also know that if we sample the family that is girl girl, then we're also pretty damn sure that uh, the person who answers the door is a girl. Okay. However, if the family is either boy girl or girl boy, then we draw a random number from the uniform distribution, so uniformly between zero and one, and we say if this number is greater than a half, then the answer, then the door will be boy, or we be girl. So indeed, we just draw 50-50 chance here. And remember, yes, it's random. I know this is pseudo random, but this is what we call randomness, guys. Not gonna go for this whole discussion again. So let's run this whole for loop here to simulate this. And now comes the interesting part, right? Because what is the probability now? Estimate the probability of two daughters given that at least one of them is a daughter. So you take the sum of all the families that are girl, girl, and divide it by the sum of all the families who are not boy, boy. So the sum of basically, well, GB plus BG. And then you see, well, what is it here? Would you think it's a half? Well, fun fact, it's not. It's actually a third. And now you can look it up at the paradox here because there are different answers to this. But here for the simulation purpose here, it gives you the answer one third. So the chance is one third, given that at least one of them is a girl. That's interesting. Now, it comes with the other one. What is the probability of two daughters? Given that you go up, you knock the door, and you knock, yeah, not knock it down, but you just knock, knock. And then the, the kid that opens the door is a girl. What's the probability that both of them are a girl? Now, then we just take the sum of all these over the sum that is not the first one being a boy. Because now you know for sure, you've seen it with your own eyes, that this person that opens is a girl. Assuming you can do this right. So what do we get here? Oh, look, and now we reach what I would say 50-50. Simulation purposes, this is 50-50. We could, of course, also just increase this number again. You know what, let's for fun, just I'm gonna clean this out. Increase this number by factor 10. So whoop, we do this a million times instead. And now I'm gonna simulate all this here again. Okay. And now let's see if I get what the simulations become now. It takes a little longer to run of course now because well, I just set it by tenfold, I just increased it by tenfold. You see here it becomes even closer to 0.3. This was now 0, 0.333. 3, 3. What was it before? 0, 0.332. 3, 3, now let's see if this came any closer to 50% now. 
404996. What was it before? 049, and that was 8. See, it becomes a little closer. See, if I increase the number, we come even closer to the actual probability, right? So this is, I think, one of the most interesting things we can apply this whole thing for here when we do this kind of theory here. So this, I know, was probably the shortest lecture I've ever given, but well, no questions, and I'm just rushing through a little. Apologize for that, but I think you guys, again, deserve the lecture here, even though I unfortunately was not feeling too well. Um, I hope this helps a bit, and I wish you all good luck with assignment number three. And uh, if everything goes well, I'll see you back for lecture number four next week. Until next time. <laughs>